you. Um, I'm going to talk very loudly. I said, hopefully you can hear me everywhere you are in the room. So hopefully this will work. So I'm going to talk today about machine learning for healthcare, but this is actually a vast and very exciting topic. And today I decided to focus on a particular part of uh, this particular agenda, which is uh, machine learning for discovery and how we can use data to make true discoveries on the basis of this available data. I'd like to start by thanking my PhD students, my postdoc, and my two research engineers. Um, and today I'm going to focus actually on the work of Jonathan, Christophe, and Georgie. Um, I don't know, I'm hearing an echo, maybe I can stop. It's good. Okay. So I always like to start with this particular quote from Sir William Osler, which is considered to be the father of modern medicine. Huh. I'm hearing myself. This will work. Okay. So if it were not for the great variability between individuals, medicine might as well be a science, not an art. And indeed, unfortunately, medicine is very much an art. And today we are going to see how, hopefully, using machine learning, we can transform this art into a science. So why is medicine still an art? Because medicine is actually very complex. It involves variability between individuals of all sorts. And this leads to different risks, different variation in symptoms, different responses to treatment, different responses over time. And hence the art of medicine has been for clinicians to make judgments on the basis of complex data on behalf of their patients. And what I believe that machine learning can do is turn this art of medicine into a science. We are not medical doctors, and neither me nor my students are really knowing medicine. However, we are engaged with a large community of clinicians throughout the globe to understand the complex problems of medicine and try to model them accurately to build machine learning. And actually, I would say one of the most exciting parts of the research we are doing is that unlike a conventional problem of, let's say, playing golf or maybe um, doing, let's say, uh, discovering cats or dogs, part of the challenge for us has been to really understand complex real life problems and model them correctly mathematically to be able to solve them using machine learning. So what is the excitement, I would say, in our research agenda is understanding this complex real world and try to understand it and then model it accurately and then transform these real life problems into things we can solve using machine learning. What's interesting is that as soon as you do that, you realize that many of the machine learning models we build are not only for medicine. So if among you there are people who are absolutely interested in medicine, Still stick with me because everything we do is useful for finance, it's useful for education, it's useful for climate change. And as a matter of fact, many of my students uh, either tend to become professors of work for Google nowadays and not necessarily working on medicine. But if you are interested and passionate about medicine, like I am, um, this is an engagement session that's not open to you, the machine learners, it's only open to clinicians, but it is on YouTube. And you can see all the different types of engagements we had with them and the problems they are discussing. So we are not inventing, sitting in our offices and trying to invent our problems to solve, but rather very much interacting with clinicians. And these are some of the key opportunities we envision on how machine learning can really transform medicine. Deliver precision medicine at the patient level, understand the basis and trajectories of health and disease, empower healthcare professionals and patients, inform and improve clinical pathways and enable better utilization of resources, and this was vital in COVID, transform population health and public health policies, and more generally, unravel new discoveries for data, from data. 
Today, I'm going to talk about all these three areas where you see an asterisk. I'm going to start with cutting edge machine learning for interpretability, so turning black boxes into white boxes. And then I'm going to talk about how can we make new discoveries on data. But let me give you a little bit of an overview of at least what my own group is doing in this machine learning for healthcare. As I mentioned, the focus is not on applying existing healthcare, uh, existing machine learning problems, but rather understand the complex realm of medicine and building new machine learning models that solve different types of problems. Let me walk you a little bit through it and then we are focusing in the talk today. So first we are doing quite a lot of work on data centric machine learning, trying to understand the focus of biases, what is the role of errors in the data, and how can we really empower this agenda? Because if the data is not good, everything we are going to learn will be corrupted as well. Where my lab has done pioneering work is in the area of synthetic data generation. And the reason this is very important is because in order to share data, we need to deal in this case with private data. And this is very challenging, and this has impaired a lot my research over the years. So we have developed a lot of technology to generate synthetic data with privacy guarantees. If you are interested to hear more about that, we gave a tutorial at ICML 2021 that's online. And also we are going to have a workshop at NeoRIPS 2022 on this topic, so join us. Then we are doing a lot of work on analytics, from automated machine learning, to causal effect inference, to causal deep learning, to transfer learning, to many, many other areas that are very important in healthcare and in many other applications. Today, I'm going to talk a lot about interpretability and discovery, so the red box over there. However, something I'm not going to talk about today, but we are doing work in, and is important for healthcare, is trustworthy machine learning. How can we come up with confidence guarantees? And I'm not talking here credible intervals, but hardcore credible intervals associated with these predictions. Because just credible interval and Bayesian approaches are often not enough, unfortunately, for medicine. And this is hard. Finally, we are building a new branch of machine learning that is aimed not at replacing clinicians, but rather empowering them. This uses ideas from inverse reinforcement learning, but goes beyond that because the focus is not imitation, but rather empowerment. I will not talk about that today, but quite a lot about it can be found on our research website under pillars. And this is something we call quite pompously quantitative epistemology. But the idea is to really understand not the black boxes of machine learning, but rather the gray boxes of humans and humans making decisions not with a focus again on imitating them and replacing them, but rather understanding them and finding the best way to support them. I'm going to talk a lot today about interpretability and discovery though. And I'd like to show to you one of my clinical collaborators, Dr. Ernie McKinney. And I, I took here a little bit of a quote from him. And what he's saying is that all problems in medicine should be considered time series problems. And they are hard time series problems. And this has led me to develop a discovery ladder. I know you are familiar with another ladder, uh, the ladder of my former colleague at UCLA, Judea Paul. This is a different ladder. And I would dare say an even more ambitious ladder because it's really pushing us to go one step forward beyond what Judea has found. And this is really necessary for medicine. So at the lowest ladder, we have what we usually do in machine learning. We are discovering associations, relationships between, let's say, variables and potentially outcomes. Then we have where Judea most of the time talks about, which is about causal relationships and trying to understand causal graphs and doing causal discovery. This is still a very important area, don't get me wrong. As a matter of fact, I'm doing myself a lot of work on causal deep learning. And again, for the ones among you who organize another workshop in 2022 on causal deep learning, and the deadline is still end of September. So if you are working on interesting things, please submit to this two workshop, either generative models for synthetic data or causal deep learning. Sorry for the 
for the advertisement, but still there are some time to that. But where really I think medicine needs to be positioned is really on discovering governing equations, trying to understand dynamical systems. So I do not need only to say this causes that, but really I would like to model dynamical systems, whether it's in healthcare my area or in other settings, where we are understanding how these dynamical systems are evolving over time. And we need to try to do that from there. And this is even more difficult than just finding what we got. I will show to you some initial results at the end, but I'm going to start at the bottom of the ladder. Because unfortunately, interpretability is at the bottom of the ladder right now. So I'm going to talk about how can we use machine learning interpretability going beyond what you may have seen today. Um, a lot of the current work on machine learning interpretability focuses on static interpretations, and I'm going to emphasize three new areas, time series interpretability, interpreting um, unsupervised representations for self-supervision or for clustering, and finally, heterogeneous treatment effect. We really need to go with machine learning interpretability between just static interpretability. I'll show you some developments along the way, but a lot more is needed. Then I'm going to talk about personalized explanation. And this will not be personalized to the intern, personalized to the patient, but rather personalized to the user of the black box model. Because each one of you comes from a different background. So for instance, if you choose to explain to you the output of a machine learning model, you may need different types of explanations depending on your unique knowledge. And finally, and the most exciting part, I think, of this talk is really how we can discover this dynamical system from data. Um, I'm going to say, unlike the previous talk, I apologize, given time, I'm going to go and I'm going not to take questions all the way to the end. Please stay time, but at the end, I'm going to take as many questions as I can. Okay, so let's start at the bottom and try to understand how we can go with machine learning interpretability beyond static predictions. So we have a black box machine learning model. It could be a transformer model or any other black box model. And we would like to move beyond the static predictions. We would like to understand how can we interpret time series data, yeah, like something produced, for instance, that was framed to an RNA or to a transformer. I'm going to then briefly tell you about how we can build machine learning interpretability for unsupervised models, and then just, again, very briefly about how can we do interpretability for causal effect in those models. So first, um, you may wonder, well, we have a lot of machine learning models for interpretability for static data, yeah? Line, sharp, learning to explain, a model that we have built ourselves in VAIS, and many others. Why are they useful for interpreting time series data? There is a very interesting paper written in NeoRIPS 2020 by Ismail and Cobb, and they show the key issue associated with it. I'm illustrating it here with a toy example, but that shows the point. You see at the top is the two saliency map of the time series model. Green is important, red is unimportant, and you see different models, again, line, sharp, gradient, integrated gradients, and so on, trying and struggling really to identify the true saliency map. Why are they all failing? Well, the answer is obvious. Time context matters. So these models, which are built for static interpretability, are not capable to really explain time series data. And you see here, for instance, I'm showing um, what would happen if I am to perturb the past information to understand the impact on the future. So if I build a dynamic perturbation operator, I could start to look at how past information is really affecting future predictions by the black box model, as learned by the black box model. So I can have, for instance, a linear combination that I'm going to, 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 to learn, and I'm going to see 
how this affects the predictions of the black box model, what methods and what not. How do we do that? We do that in this paper that appeared last year, Dynamas, in a very simple way. So the first steps are really very intuitive. We have an input time series model that we pass through the black box model, and then for stop, we want to understand what has the model looked at. For that, we are going to create a perturbation operator, a mass, that is going to perturb the input, and this will lead to a perturbed output. The difference between the two, the error, is propagated back. And in this way, we adapt the saliency score. So we are learning the saliency score associated with this black box model. Well, this is wonderful. But what we need, we really need to have interpretability is we need to have parsimonious explanations. And what do I mean by that is we don't want something like at the top where all, everything in green is considered important. We don't want that the model says, well, that the, the explanation says everything has been important. We want to find the minimum amount of features which were important for this model to issue the prediction. So, for instance, in order to enable parsimony, we can add a regularization to enforce sparsity. What about another measure of interpretability over time? Congress explanations. What we mean by that is we do not want to have explanations that go back and forth. We would like to have some type of consistency and robustness. For that, we can add another type of regularization to penalize saliency jumps over time. With this now two topic, two things in mind, we can define some form of legibility of the mask. And to measure the legibility of the mask, we import some ideas from information theory, but we generalize them. In view of time, I'm not going to put equations on the board. You can take a look at our Dynamos paper if you want to see them. I'm going to intuitively explain to you what we are trying to do. So what we are trying to do is, in order to have congruity and parsimony, we introduce the notion of mask information and mask entropy. So you see that as we go, for instance, from left to right, we are increasing the mask information. And as we go from bottom to up, we increase the mask entropy. And ideally, we want to focus on the minimum amount of information and the minimum entropy to explain a particular solution. Now that we have a notion of legibility of this mask, we go back to the original example, and again, this is a co example in the paper. We have a variety of examples that are real, some where we know the ground truth, some where we don't. So you can take a look there. But I'm returning to this co example to show to you now that you have the true saliency mask, you have the Dyna mask, and you see that it resembles it quite well. And you also see measure, for instance, in this case of entropy associated with it. And this provides you with a tool to really compare these different types of saliency mass, not only in terms of quality, but also in terms of legibility. Very much the beginning of the research agenda in time series interpretability. So I really hope that more of you will, will join that agenda. Let me now move to another area where there is very little research, and that is really understanding unsupervised models. All the existing works in machine learning post of interpretability for focus on supervised learning. But what about unsupervised learning, which is very important in medicine, but in many other areas? Self-supervised learning, clustering. They are all examples of unsupervised models where we would like to understand what has happened, what is the machine learning model learning. And this is again work that um, is relatively recent, it's just from this ICML, where the focus was on building post hoc interpretability for unsupervised models. Let me start motivating the reason as to why we looked at this from a medical point of view. Here you see another collaborator of mine, Dr. Vincent Karnakagasa, complicated name, so it's difficult to pronounce. 
And we think we have built a variety of machine learning models for prostate cancer, where we are looking at how different uh, men who have prostate cancer are actually evolving over time. And it is well known that some of them uh, are really going to die from something else. Prostate cancer will not affect them, while for others is going to turn into a very uh, uh, aggressive disease and the way in which we manage it needs to be very different. So identifying clusters and clusters over time is something very important. We have used machine learning to really do that and validated that together with our clinical collaborators. But an important question is, what do these models really learn? So that was one reason. Another reason you see here, um, another paper, so one of the first papers, we believe to be the first paper that did cell supervision for tabular data is um, um, this paper called Vine from two years back. Um, and we, we developed it for the general setting of self supervised learning for tabular data in general, which is a lot more complex than for images or for uh, text. And the reason is the structure still needs to be learned in images and text. We have some inherent correlations, but in tabular data, you need to learn that. But the reason we moved to this endeavor was because polygenic risk scores or genetic scores are still complex to, to determine. So again, the focus was, can we really understand not only why things like Vine work very well, but what do they really learn? And finally, what we really wanted to have is both feature and example-based explanations, compare representations for a variety of explanation models, and we wanted to understand a variety of neural network architectures. So again, we use a lot of self-supervised learning models in our lab, a lot of um, autoencoders, and we wanted to really learn what they do. I'm not going to go into your times to talk about this, but if you are interested in and you are building autoencoders or you are doing self-supervised learning, you want to see what are your models learning, please take a look at this paper and What's interesting is we see that there are some very big problems associated with autoencoders in general. Many of them claim disentanglement, but what they do is nothing by disentanglement. And maybe that will give you, if you are a researcher in that area, some kind of angle, some tool to build new methods for uh, unsupervised learning that are more effective. Again, one simple word about the last work, um, heterogeneous effect inference. So we do a lot of work on causality and causal effectiveness. What treatment is best for what person? However, many of these models, we just evaluate in terms of their performance, in terms of mean square error, for instance, or accuracy. But what do they learn? This is very important because interpretability is key because we really provide Doctors recommendation. So we have built something called interpretability, which is the first interpretability method for causal effectiveness. So please take a look. But what I want to do instead is I want to tell you about something really quite different. All these models are good for interpretability, but what about debugging models? We really want with clinicians to debug these models, to see if that makes sense for the specific clinician using them. And the previous methods are not really ideal. They give a lot of information at the level of individualized or global feature importance. They may give both example explainability as well as feature interpretability, but this is not targeted to the individual knowledge and individual know-how of the clinician debugging. So can we move to the next frontier? Can we move from a one-size-fits-all explanation? And again, one-size-fits-all here doesn't mean that I don't do instance wise which are important. What I mean is that the explanations are the same for all of you. Can I move to a personalized explanation for each one of you, depending on what you know? So what do I have in mind? I have here again a black box model, which was trained on some population. But now the clinician, that is going to see Bob, wants to see an explanation that's not generic. He wants to see an explanation that's personalized to him. And by the way, we do a lot of these uh, machine learning models that are trained on one country, for instance, UK, 
but then we are trying to test that in another country, like for instance, United States, the Netherlands, or even more challenging, an Asian country where the population is really quite a lot, quite different. So we are definitely building models for transfer learning and so on. But see in the end, what did the model has learned? What, what really has it learned? And can the clinician in this country create a personalized explanation? So what do we really want? We want to have personalized exploration with respect to a corpus of examples. So for instance, I may be uh, wanting an explanation with respect to a set of past experiences of me. And I'm going to ask this, uh, I'm going to ask the machine learning model to explain its prediction from the basis of a corpus of my past experience. What happens then is the method that I'm going to introduce is going to select out of this pool of experience of me, which will be different than one of you, the most relevant examples, as well as the features associated with them. So for the first time, we are going to be able to do both feature and example explanations together. If you are familiar with machine learning interpretability, you know that most of the time, we have either feature-based explainability or instance-based explainability. Now we are going to be able to do it together. And we are going to be able to do it together uh, different for the different users of the black box models. For that, we are going to build a novel approach that's going to be an integrated Jacobian, which will go beyond and it will be a generalization of integrated gradients, which is one of the workforces of machine learning interpretability, and this will enable us to bridge this feature and example-based explanations, and will enable us to choose explanations that are personalized to the user, and we can do that for any type of data, whether it's tabular data, whether it's uh, imaging, time series, etc. Again, this is a paper that's uh, appeared at last few weeks, and we call it simplex. If you are an optimization person, you are going to see this play of, of words, why we call it simplex in just a little bit. So let's understand the problem set up better. I have an example whose prediction I would like to explain on the basis of a corpus of past experience of me, which may be different than the one of you. So the corpus is personalized to the user. And I would like to understand why this particular black box model has issued this prediction for this example X. We all know that um, usually we are creating representations and these representations in the latent space are highlighted here. And these representations are going to be very important because usually when I hear such a representation, if I have two points, let's say H3 and H2, which are close to H, they are also going to be closed in the prediction space. So closing the latent space will mean closing the prediction space. No doubt, this is not true for the input space, and this is due to adversarial examples. So being close by in the input space does not translate to being close in the prediction space. However, being close in the latent space does translate to a close prediction. So what we are going to use as the key idea is we are going to try to use explanations that are built in the latent space and then try to understand how does this relate to the features in the input space. So, for instance, here is a very simple example where there are these two uh, close by corpus representations that are going to be able to explain my current um, representation age. What I will need, though, to make sense out of this and present to the user the closest by examples is to bring this back to the input space. For that, I'm going to define a corpus, and the key idea will be to find the best corpus decomposition for this example age. This may or may not be possible. So if I am lucky, 
my past experience will be close to the one example I'm now trying to explain. But if I'm unlucky, this may be very far away from it. I'm going to have a residual associated with it. So if the experience and the corpus I give for, in, in terms of which I want an explanation, is close by, I'm going to be in the convex hull of this. Otherwise, I'm going to have a residual. And I'm going to be able to explain, but given this residual. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, in order to, to really transfer these corpus explanations to the input space now, I'm going to fix a baseline input x0, which is going to have this representation h0. And I'm going to compare each corpus example to this baseline. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to understand, and if you know a little bit about integrated gradients, you will see here the parallel. I'm going to try to understand the total shift in the latent space in terms of individual contributions from each corpus member. Let us do that. So what I have is I have, I'm interested to bring in whatever I discover in the later space to the input space. I'm going to assume that if I have, for instance, a shift in the input space, yeah, a shift in the input space, this will lead in the latent space to this particular um, curve. What do I want to do here? I'm going to want to project, um, I'm going to compute these projections, this projected Jacobian, which is going to be this term over here. And what this term is going to do is going to compute the contribution of example I in the corpus C to this shift in the representation. Then, what I'm going to compute is I'm going to compute the projections of this particular example I to the shift in the latent space by looking at these projections on the basis of the integrated Jacobian. Yeah? So a generalization of the integrated gradient, but now um, we are having this Jacobian which is going to measure how much different examples in the corpus selected by the user that one's explanation of are going to contribute to this shift in the latent space. So I'm now able to create this link between the two. With this link, I can then look at what will happen if I perturb certain things in the latent space. Which examples are going to be um, are going to be responsible for that, and vice versa. So I can link now example and feature based explainability for this perturbation. So in this way, simplex is going to be able to determine to me for me the closest example to the current representation age. These are going to be, for instance, the examples that are closest. And these are the features that most contribute to the particular prediction. So I have now a, a, a way to unify example-based and feature-based explanation. What's nice about it is that I'm now able to debug these black box models depending on your unique knowledge. So for instance, if I have a UK doctor and the United States doctor, each one of them with their own pool of knowledge. They can come to an already trained black box model and find explanations associated with this. In our paper, we go through many examples where we show what's happening if the system extrapolates and how, for instance, the outcomes that are going to be presented may actually show that the example selected by the model as being closest, whether they make sense to the user. Are indeed these examples closest to what they think is close by? And are the predictions being made indeed due to the same reason, due to the same feature importance as the user thinks? 
So a, a way now to really debug this model. Let me say that all these different groups have a lot of work on machine learning interpretability. ability. If you are interested to play with the code or um, really see some of these works, we have not only our own work, we have also quite a lot of other implementations of other machine learning interpretability in the GitHub. So, so please take a look and play with it if, you, if this is something of interest. But in the remaining of time, I'm going to really talk about going really to this discovery stage. And what do I really mean by discovery again? Discovering powerful models that will enable us to understand experiment and act judiciously. And for that, we really need to go beyond what I just showed to you before, feature and example-based explanations. What I'm interested in is to understand from data and distill from data governing equations. And what do I mean by governing equations are compact and closed form equations. What do I have in mind? Let's take some examples that are very familiar to you all from physics. We have governing equations in the form of explicit functions, implicit functions, ordinary differential equations, or partial differential equations. And we all know these equations from physics. And we like such equations because they are concise, generalizable, amenable to further analysis. We can understand, for instance, the stability of this system. We can understand transient states. We understand how to act on them and what the response will be. And they're really interpretable to, to human experts. So the question is, can we do the same for medicine? And you may think that medicine is too complex for that. And indeed, medicine is smart. But we do have already some governing equations in medicine already. For instance, we have regression-based models and like hazard models for risk prediction in the form of explicit equations. We have famous equations in pharmacology. We have methods for uh, modeling tumor growth. And I'm going to go back to this example in a little bit. And unfortunately, in COVID, we all saw these SCIR and SEIR models, which are epidemiological models of growth of disease and infection. These are all examples of such equations of medicine. And conventionally, it is human experts that have built this equation, both in physics as well as in medicine. And we have brilliant minds that have worked from physics to the physiological to the psychological that came up with these governing equations. And they require brilliant insights and distillation of knowledge. But I'm going to argue that this is not necessarily what we want. We do not want to replace humans, but we want to empower humans and not let it all to experts. Let's be honest, these experts believe for many years that the world is flat. For many years, we didn't know a lot about how a variety of drugs and a variety of diseases are operating. So ideally, what we would like to do is we would like to empower the experts with machine learning and data to be able to understand this governing equation. And this is really important because in medicine, things are very complex. We deal, we deal with dynamical complex systems. So it is very difficult for human experts to consider all the complex data they have at their availability to unravel these equations. So I think, and I hope to appeal to you all to really embark with, with us in this discovery of equations from data to empower humans, not replace them. I'm going to start by showing to you something relatively simple, but not possible after a few years back. How can we get from data using machine learning explicit functions? And then I'm going to move to more exciting case of ordinary differential equations. As I mentioned to you, already we have in medicine such risk factors and risk equations. And this is an example of a cumulative, a cumulative hazard model built for breast cancer prediction, which is used both in the United States and in the UK. And we know it is not very effective. So 
we have built a machine learning model that I'm going to just very briefly introduce to you a little bit later, which is significantly better than an agent's credit. But the trouble with it, it was that it was a black box model. So what we have needed, what we needed to do in order to be able to uh, provide um, a method that can be used by clinicians and can be adopted by the standard committees was to turn black box models into white box models. So what clinicians and the regulatory bodies wanted, they wanted black box models that come in, form, in the form of equations. This is something that I didn't mandate, but it's mandated, for instance, by the Joint Committee on Cancer in the United States. They do not need, though, to be linear equations like regression. They can be nonlinear equations. But how to find them? So what we built, and I'm going to show to you an example briefly, is black box models that are able to do such predictions much better than existing regression models. But we needed a way to turn them into an explicit function, such that they are approved by this type of bodies. And for that, we have built a variety of methods to turn black box models into white box models for this prediction. And that comes in the form of these symbolic meta models. So what are these meta models? Are models of models. So we built white box models of black box models. And what we are going to do is the black box model is F. And what we are going to try to discover is a white box model F that approximates this black box model F. How do we do that? Just as a toy idea, I'm not going to go into all the details, but just a toy idea is I have a black box model that resides in this model space. And then the user can determine the type of uh, white box model it wants. In medicines, this may be something like an analytic expression that's mandated. In other scenarios, there may be something like a closed form expression. In physics, for instance, if you are a physicist, maybe a Bessel function is what's interesting to you. So you can select the restricted white box model space on the basis of which you want to explain this black box model F. How do we find though this G? We find this G by searching projections into the selected um, meta model space G. So we find an F that best up, a G that, me, that best approximates F in this space selected by the user. This sounds easy, but how do we do that? In our first paper, we learn a very good set of basis functions. So we use actually something from communication systems, which is called a Meyer G function. These Meyer G functions are very powerful and express this basis on the basis of which you can project a complex nonlinear function F and learn in this Meyer G function using simple gradient descent what are the representations G that are best approximating F. In a second subsequent work that we have published, we went one step further, and there what we did is no longer we use some fixed basis, but rather we use a basis pursuit model, where the basis becomes more and more complex depending on the function F and the error we may be getting to tolerate. But for the first time in this way, we are able to take a black box model F and approximate it very accurately with a white box function G. So the story that black box functions, that machine learning is black box, is no longer true. We can take a black box model F, train, and then approximate it with some symbolic meta models with a white box function G, and use this function G now to give to clinicians or anybody who wants to see a white box model. Let's see an example. So as I mentioned to you, we, we are doing a lot of work in our lab on AutoML. As a matter of fact, together with a few colleagues, we organized this summer the first AutoML conference immediately after ICML 2022. And in our lab, we are very focused on AutoML because we really need to build a large number of analytics at scale. One of the analytics that we built was this AutoML framework for risk prediction that we call autoprognosis. And we really 
when we can see how much better our top of noise is does than the NHS predict. And the results of this study are in you know, a relatively recent nature machine intelligence. And the reason I really like this study is it's extremely comprehensive. We really look at internal validation and external validation in a cohort that we have never seen in more than 1 million patients. And you are able to show without any doubt that machine learning is significantly superior, even for this simple task, to regressions. Um, this number may not look a lot, but it is huge. A large number of patients, especially young patients or patients that have uh, more complex um, disease in breast cancer are misclassified by the regression model. But as I mentioned to you, this is a black box model. It cannot be adopted. So this is why we use the symbolic meta models and we learn equations associated with this. You can see the equations in the paper. I'm not going to put them to you here. As a matter of fact, we work very closely with clinicians because these equations may not make sense to you and me, but they need to make really sense to, to, to them. And what is nice about it is this black box model, autoprognosis, guided us to find this white box model, which is a non-linear but transparent equation um, associated with autoprognosis. Then, with this, this meta model that we are going to use in practice. So you have the same transparency as a regression, but with nonlinear terms and a lot more efficient. And the autoprognosis box cannot throw away. It just has guide us in finding this black box in this white box model. And then you can do all sorts of things, inclusively individualized um, estimation of what variables were important. And you can do this in a much more quantitative way than any machine learning interpretability model because we have a true equation associated with this. So all the sensitivity analysis can now be done in a very quantitative way for this particular patient. Let me down now at the end talk about what I believe to be more really the exciting part of this discovery agenda. Can we learn dynamical systems from data? Can we learn ordinary differential equations, for instance, from data? And this is a much harder problem. So what do I have in mind? I have a data set, for instance, of tumor growth and tumor growth over time with potential interventions. And what I'd like to understand is the underlying ordinary differential equations that have guided that. Can I do that? Well, first you may wonder what do we have right now in machine learning to solve the problem? The closest that comes to this is symbolic regression. Symbolic regression of the shell doesn't work, but variation of symbolic regression do. The challenge associated with this is that they all require us to estimate derivatives. And if you are familiar with symbolic regression, you know that it doesn't work well when we have noise or when we have um, irregularly sampled data, which is most of the time in the world, whether it's in medicine or something. So symbolic regression is unfortunately very vulnerable to use in practice. At this stage, if you are a machine learner, you are going to say, what about neural ODEs? We love neural ODEs. Can they solve this problem? Well, neural ODEs are wonderful, but they are black box models. They are useful for making predictions. But note, what I want here is a true discovery. I don't want to just make predictions. I want to have a true equation that I can use, and I can say this is what's distilled on the basis of these data. However, um, so neural ODEs are not very really efficient here, but since um, I, I'm trying to promote the work of my students, I'm going to say that if you are interested in black box models, we have developed recently neural Laplace, which is significantly better in making predictions in complex settings with noise and errors than neural Laplace. So if you are interested not in necessarily making interpretable equations out of it, but just making high quality predictions in dynamic settings with errors, neural Laplace is significantly outperforming neural ODs and can take a look. But the focus today is not in black boxes. 
it's on white boxes, understanding these governing equations of, of medicine. And for that, we built DECODE, which stands for discovering closed form ODEs. You can see the play on words. And in order to understand the code, I want to take you briefly to the variational formulation um, of ODEs, which may be familiar to a few, but maybe not familiar to most of you. So what does this variational formulation of ODEs do? They characterize an ODE without requiring a derivative. So remember, the reason we don't like symbolic regression is relies on these derivatives, and they are not. We, can, we cannot deal with them well in the real world. So the variational formulation will allow us to circumvent this. So you see here the variational formulation of these ODEs, and what we do for that is we define these functionals C. And these functionals are actually the sum of these two integrals. And what's important for you to know is that actually they do not need the derivative of x. What they do need is a derivative of this functional g. But g is something I'm going to be able to select and design. So I'm going to select g such that the derivative is easy to compute. Um, and what I need to do is actually I need to de define this system of equations in such a way that this, this functional is um, equal to zero for all the functions that are continuously differentiable and vanishing at endpoints. All of this, let me, in view of time and the fact that I want to go to introduce to you the key idea rather than key mathematics that you can look in the web paper. What I want to show to you is that we, the reason this is interesting and this is important is not because I can show to you an equation and I can show to you a theorem. It's because this is constructional. This is going to be able to guide us to discover and to design this function G. So what we are going to first prove is that minimizing the value of this functional C corresponds to finding the be a better approximation to the ODE. We do that in this particular theorem, which is not that easy to prove, but you can find the details in the paper. But the reason, this is not decorative, what I call decorative math. This is constructional math. And the reason this is constructional math is it's going to guide us, this theorem is going to guide us and tell us what type of G we could select. One of the many ones that we could use is the sync functions, the sync basis. With this now in, in mind, we can build this decode algorithm, which has a preprocessing step where we are denoising and interpolating the trajectories. And then on the basis of this, we can go to the second step, which is this optimization, where we are going to be able to use this functions G that we have just constructed. We are now able to use symbolic regression because now we are able to compute the derivative, not of, of original function f, but rather this g that we have constructed. So symbolic regression can come to the rescue now because we do not deal with the original functions, but rather with these design functions for which the derivative is easy to compute. Now, how well does decode do in practice? Well, first we want, don't forget, we want to discover equations from data. So initially, in order to know that this method works, I need to start by discovering something I already know, and I need to show that I'm able to do that. And then I can go into discovering something I do not know. I'm going to try to start by discovering dynamical systems of the ones that are shown in there. And what we in effect do is we, we create, um, a data set by throwing away a lot of samples, creating all sorts of noise and perturbations, and then see, can you really still uncover the real underlying equations or not? We start with the compared and generalized logistic models, and the reason we like them is because they are very similar to medicine. We often in medicine need to unravel asymmetric growth with saturation. 
And what you see now is that if you have different types of noise levels, different types of irregularities in the sampling data, different number of samples on the basis of which you need to learn, because don't forget, in medicine, we never have millions of samples like you often have in natural language processing or many settings. You need to be able to learn very low sample version. And what you can see is that the code significantly outperforms the only other existing methods which are based on variation of symbolic progression. At this stage, I want to move to another one, a chaotic system. Because again, in medicine, we often have in cancer, for instance, we have chaotic systems. Can we still learn? And the answer is we can learn uh, with the code very well. And what's nice is we can even learn to predict better. If the focus is just prediction, we can learn and predict better than even neural ODs. Neural ODs are incapable to, to deal with something like um, a chaotic system. And the reason behind that is because they are using the inverse value problem. They need to solve the inverse value problem. And if you have chaotic systems, that's a, that's a big challenge. Yet the code is able to, to, to do that. Finally, can we really discover something where we don't know the underlying ground truth? And for that, we turn to trying to learn tumor growth from data. And for that, we used a paper uh, that provided a nature paper, a recent nature paper that provided the results of eight clinical trials on cancer patients with and without tumor volume. And usually, if the um, trajectory is similar in the known, for instance, with chemotherapy, you often would see a trajectory like that. This is just one exemplary uh, result. You show that it goes down for some time, the tumor decreases and then increases again over time because it becomes unfortunately resistant. So what does decode and symbolic regression learn? You see here two equations associated with them, a lot more in the paper. But what I want to show to you is first that decode learns a more compact equation than symbolic regression and one that is capable to learn this um, Let's say it's the fact that the tumor goes down and then eventually grows again. Is this the two equation? We don't know. We would need now to go to the lab test. But this is the very beginning, I would say, part of the research agenda. So, can we learn ordinary differential equations from data? We made a big deal with this decode. I'm sure a lot more needs to happen. There are many problems we still need to solve. Can we learn partial differential equations from data? This is even more complex. Uh, in recent times, together with Christophe and Geology, we uh, put on archive a paper that is able to do that. That is really at a very cutting edge of what we can learn from data and combines ideas from mathematics and physics with ideas from machine learning. This is very important for medicine, but for many other areas as well. So I hope that you are interested, get interested in these topics and, and, and join us because we need all the brains we can convert to, to, to this agenda to learn how disease evolves. So what I'm trying to argue in this talk is to join me in trying to climb this ladder. Even at the level of associations, we do not have enough methods for machine learning interpretability, as I showed you, time series prediction. Treatment effect estimation. We still do not have good methods for that. We are starting to build them in recent years only. Causal deep learning, a big research agenda in my lab and the others. But what ideally we need is to learn dynamical systems from data, where we learn not only causal relationships, but how do they really um, look like um, over time and how much. Um, um, if you are interested, I want to welcome you to interact with my students. So we started two years back in the pandemic, uh, an engagement session that we call Inspiration Exchange. We have this um, every month, we have 20 so far, and we welcome uh, researchers from all different fields 
In recent times, we, we interacted with a variety of industry researchers as well. The focus is on building a community of machine learning for healthcare to discuss some of these key cutting edge research areas. So, so please, please join us. In the next one, we plan to talk about these methods of neural Laplace and beyond and how eventually time series models uh, in this complex era of medicine uh, can be developed and where we are at and what is the status quo and how we can hopefully go further. With that being said, since I'm in the summer school, I need to advertise for uh, PhD positions. So um, I have a very international and brilliant group, and I hope to, 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 to recruit new students, hopefully among you. Um, if you are interested, please drop us alone. Thank you very much.